Welcome to this preview of the Stockton Symphony's November concerts. We've called them Brilliant Gems. And we've called it that because the program is a great mixture. We've got a great couple of pieces that really are wonderful old beloved masterworks. And then at the end of the program, we have a symphony that really deserves a lot more exposure. First up, we have Copeland's Fanfare for the Common Man. Maybe we should say common person. <laughs> Definitely. Copeland was one of 18 composers that Eugene Goosens asked to write fanfares for the Cincinnati Symphony. 18. This was in 1942 as a contribution to the war effort. And Copeland said that he gave it this unusual title because he wanted to celebrate the common man. He said, after all, that's who was in the army and was contributing all of this and he needed a fanfare. So out of these 18 fanfares, Copeland's really is the only one that survived in the repertoire, right? It was immediately a success. And this was after the 1943 performance. Since then, all kinds of groups have taken it up, including rock groups like the Rolling Stones and Emerson, Lake and Palmer. Wow, that takes us back. But Copeland always, always said he liked his original version best. Well, of course. And it really has become like an iconic piece in the repertoire. It's got those great open intervals that sound so Copeland-esque, like those famous ballets, Billy the Kid and Appalachian Spring and Rodeo that we love so much. Check this out. It's got percussion and brass. So I'm playing the, the percussion down here. Peter, to tell you a little bit about why this is so important to the Stockton Symphony. So not only is the piece iconic in the overall repertoire, but how many people remember the Business Leadership Summit that we had a great run of those events each year? Almost all of them were in our home auditorium, Atherton Auditorium at Delta College, and they would start at some unearthly hour in the morning and we would have all the brass and percussion of the Stockton Symphony play. And if you know that hall, it's got this kind of semicircular stage that's on a hydraulic lift. So we would always make a big entrance, right? And so it would be slowly rising while we would eventually see the brass players and myself. But the thing is, what probably nobody knows, is that when it was rising, it was vibrating like this. And so at, let's say, 8 o'clock in the morning, a trumpet player or a horn would have to be like this with the whole stage shaking, and they would still play it flawlessly. It was a gig that was really one of the most amazing events of each season. Now in a few minutes, we'll talk about the middle of this program, but now let's fast forward to the end. The big closing number of this program is Florence Price's Symphony No. 1 in E minor. Florence Price was an amazing person who grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas, and she was able to transcend all the problems that beset her in that environment. And her parents sent her to the New England Conservatory of Music, where she studied organ and composition. She even studied with George Chadwick and was very much influenced by his interest in including American indigenous music in his works. And Chadwick had been sort of encouraged to do this by Dvorak, right? Yes, Dvorak had come to America and he had admonished all American composers to use what was there in their country, spirituals, indigenous Indian music, and make it their own to create a whole national American kind of music. So isn't it kind of interesting that 
Dvorak, who himself had developed sort of a nationalistic style in, in his home country. But here we have a Czech composer coming to America. He composed, he conducted, he taught, and he was giving us very good advice about how we would develop our own national style. So Florence Price absorbed all of that, like a lot of people who had been gone from their native south to study, she came back hoping to give back to her community. And so she taught for a while in Little Rock. She also taught in Atlanta and she married. And when her family started feeling the effects of the violence in regard to the Jim Crow laws that came into effect, they moved to Chicago. And she, while she was there, entered a competition. She entered this symphony and it caught the attention. It won first prize. Wow. And it caught the attention of Frederick Stock, who is the conductor of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. And he programmed it on his next series of concerts. And that's how she got national recognition. And she even got recognition across in Europe. And wasn't this actually the first instance of an American work being premiered where the composer was a female African-American. That's exactly right. And so she was a real pioneer. Now, we've talked about Dvorak's influence. And one of the hallmark things that Dvorak did in his New World Symphony, which had an influence on, Janie just mentioned Chadwick and some other composers like uh, Samuel Coleridge Taylor. The idea that if you're in a minor key, and both Dvorak's New World Symphony and Florence Price's uh, symphony or in the key of E minor. If you have a normal E minor scale, that's one of the flavors of them, but this note right here is called the leading tone. Dvorak and everybody else really like to get the folksy flavor by having the lower degree. And so that's one flavor that makes it kind of distinctive. And the other is the idea of a pentatonic scale, where you basically only have five notes. You know, you don't use all the possible notes in between. And both of these things together give this opening that kind of distinctive Americanistic flair. Here's the opening to the first movement of Florence Price's Symphony No. 1. And so you told us that by the time Florence Price wrote this symphony, she had moved to Chicago. But let's go back to that time when she was developing her career in Little Rock. Little Rock had a burgeoning community of businesses by black entrepreneurs. There were upholsterers, dressmakers, cobblers, lawyers, doctors. Her father was the main dentist there in Little Rock. Amazing. And he had a special fondness for elementary education and founded several schools. Her mother was an elementary school teacher. And so it came naturally to her to want to teach, which she did when she came back to Little Rock, but also to spread what she knew in the form of her compositions. So with all of that background, let's talk about the second movement now of the symphony, which really kind of seems like maybe it's grounded in the church. I mean, Definitely. It, it, it sounds very hymn-like, and there's the, even the idea of response, you know, the, the main big congregation and then a smaller intimate group of people making right. sort of a, a, an answer, if you will. And right. that, that's sort of built into the music. So we'll hear two sort of main groups and two smaller responses.
But something that Dvorak never put into a symphony was a juba dance. A juba dance. And so what did Florence Price do here? A juba dance is a dance that relates to slave times when people would make percussion sounds by patting juba, patting their uh, shoulders, their thighs, and whatever percussive sounds their body could make. So using almost anything they could for a percussion instrument, it's kind of almost like the precursor to stomp, right? Right. And so uh, Florence Price used the juba dance in several of her compositions, and particularly here in the third movement. And so this drumming will actually be there when you come to the concert, right? Uh, we will actually have percussion drumming. I can't do that at the piano, but what you can hear are these wonderful sort of syncopated rhythms. It's almost like the precursor to ragtime. <laughs> turn to the last movement and this one I think you might find some relationship to Dvorak. Well yes and we've talked about the relationship not only for Florence Price but for Chadwick and Samuel Coleridge Taylor you know Dvorak was a huge influence of course each one of these composers and certainly Florence Price took those and, and made them their own but even so, there is a striking resemblance to the, I think that both of them were influenced by Irish country fiddling. I mean, listen to That's these triplets. Cool, very cool. Yeah. <laughs> We were talking about the Dvorak influence, so I just can't help remembering this little bit, which some of you may recognize from the last movement of Dvorak's New World Symphony. <laughs> We're gonna to go to the middle part of this program. I was able to record just a couple of days ago a live Zoom session with our piano soloist, Rodolfo Leone. And one of the very last concerts we gave before the shutdown of the pandemic had Rodolfo at the 11 and a half hour saving us because a different soloist had fallen ill. Rodolfo played the Beethoven Emperor Concerto, having just won a piano competition featuring the Beethoven Piano Competition. Uh, it was awesome. It was awesome. But here he's going to be playing the Saint-Saëns Second Piano Concerto. And so we're going to take a time out here, a little aside to talk about the correct pronunciation for Camille Saint-Saëns' last name. It is correct to say Saint-Saëns. So you can't win. Because... If anybody's had a smattering of high school French in this country, we think that we're being so cultured and correct to say Sasson and not to pronounce the final S. But actually, all the Parisian conductors and musicians and composers we know, having met them at the Aspen Music Festival for many years, they all say Sassons with the final S. So you can't win because no matter how you say it, somebody's going to think you're wrong. In any case, here's that great interview with Rodolfo. Enjoy. Rodolfo, it is so great to see you. I think it's almost exactly two years since we worked together. Can you believe it? Yeah, I, unfortunately, I can't believe it. Um, <laughs> I was very happy to, to work with you and the, the orchestra in Stockton two years ago. You were the knight in shining armor, riding to our rescue, playing the Beethoven Emperor Concerto, and hadn't you just won a competition? That's right, yeah. Uh, a couple years prior, uh, the Beethoven Vienna Piano Competition, uh, and I was lucky enough to participate and win the first prize, and uh, so I guess that's how the Beethoven connection came when you were looking for a uh, new pianist at the last minute. We've had this 
pandemic for the, over a year and a half now. And, and what has life been like for you during this time? Uh, a lot of cancellations happened last year, as we all know. Let's call it opportunities for introspection. <laughs> uh, lots of practicing, not being able to do the thing that you do, uh, being prevented from doing it for force majeure. It's just, it's not the, the best feeling in the world. That's for sure. So I'm, I'm super happy to, to see that things are starting again and we're starting to see some live performances. And I can't be more thrilled to be in Stockton in a few weeks. There is light at the end of the tunnel. We've asked you to play the Saint-Saëns second piano concerto. And I know that you're still pretty young. You don't have to tell us how young you are, but I know you're still pretty young. Have you played this piece with an orchestra before, or will this be like the grand opening of a, of a, of a tradition going on here? This will actually be the grand opening. It's going to be very exciting, and uh, it, it'll be a great opportunity. Many people have remarked that the opening of this concerto is kind of inspired by Johann Sebastian Bach. Can you show us how that might work? This is the beginning of the concerto. The concerto begins with a solo piano cadenza uh, for, for those who have never listened to it. Um, and as you were saying, there is this kind of Bach-like voices and improvisation style. So here it goes. It's, an, it's a very demanding, challenging opening, not unlike la, our last collaboration, with what, which was the uh, Beethoven's Emperor Concerto, like you mentioned, also a concerto that begins with a cadenza. I wanted to play a little bit, um, this is not a piece that I play, but um, a little bit of this um, G minor fantasy. Um, it's called either a fantasy or a preludium and fu at fuga, so pre preludium fugue, and it's meant for organ. so much sense hearing that now because Sassons himself uh, at, at least some of the time was an organist is that correct absolutely yeah yeah now unlike the Beethoven that you played with us a couple of years ago not only is there this Fantasia like beginning but in a way the whole movement is sort of like a Fantasia and then a lyrical theme comes later which I'm told is related to a piece by Foray. Yeah, so apparently he kind of stole, <laughs> this, so, to, so to speak, the theme from his student. So Foray, I believe, was a student of Camille Saint-Saëns. And um, it's a very lyrical, uh, but somewhat unconventional uh, theme. So after basically the introduction, we have two small pizzicati. And then we have piano solo.
way, it's very it's it's unexpected for someone that goes to uh, to a concert and expects maybe Liszt's piano concerto or any of the Beethoven or uh, Tchaikovsky. This is not your typical concerto. And so. Since we've started with the slow movement, as you say, we've already kind of upset the norm. You can't follow that with your typical middle slow movement. So what happens next is pretty sprightly, right? It's kind of like a scherzo. I will play just a little bit of the beginning just to get an idea. So with this kind of approach, we have um, the very typical, uh, more typical, I would say, kind of sensans, more um, joyous and almost um, joking side. It sounds kind of Mendelssohn-esque a little bit. Absolutely, absolutely. So after this really lighthearted stuff, it's it's actually fairly fast, but you know he can't keep alternating fast and slow. So we started with a slow movement, then we've got a scared so, but he has to wind up with something even more impressive. And so the notes just really fly in the in the finale, in the last movement. I, I would say also very dramatic, but it doesn't lose uh, the kind of um, kind of joyous and almost scherzo like approach. Um, so he, he never really goes full, fully tragic, so to say. But it's it's a very, very interesting movement. Um, we have this kind of the, the basic uh, motif of the movement are these three descending notes. And we have four bars of orchestra and piano just repeating these triplets. And this is kind of the saltarella, which is a Right. So what's, uh, it's an Italian inspired uh, dance. Yeah, very folkloristic dance. It, it's no secret that you've got a, a great bit of Italian heritage there, right? Yeah, there you go. I can't, I can't hide it. <laughs> <laughs> you already sound completely ready to give the, uh, the Rodolfo premiere of the Saint-Saëns Second Piano Concerto with our <laughs> orchestra. We're, we're, re really, we're really looking forward to this. Fantastic. It's, uh, also, I can't wait. And I know that it will be a fantastic experience. Uh, I've loved working with the Stockholm Symphony. I've loved working with you. Uh, I can't wait to be there. And I hope to see maybe some familiar faces in the audience too. It'll be a grand reunion. And so we'll see you soon. Ciao. Ciao. So we're really looking forward to these brilliant GEMS performances. There is both an evening performance and a matinee performance at Atherton Auditorium, Delta College. And we want to talk especially about the brilliant program notes that Janie writes, because now there are many different options, right? You'll get a small program printed, which you can get at the concert itself. You'll also be able to use the QR code on that program to access full program notes and bios. And you can go on the website to download an even bigger full program, which has all kinds of extras. And so please go to the Stockton Symphony website and make full use of everything we've got there. And we really want to know how you feel. Keep letting us know how you like this hybrid solution for the program notes. And most of all, we want to tell you we love you. It makes such a difference in these grand reopening concerts, some of the first indoor performances we've had in a long time with the Stockton Symphony. We're really looking forward to seeing you there.